Hi, everyone. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Rabbi. Net. Hi, Rabbi. Hi, Ruth. Hello. Mark. Marcus. And Shmuel. Hello again, Rabbi. <laughs> For the second time in one evening. <laughs> Life is just getting better. A long evening. It's going to be a long evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did I miss a Rashi class? Sorry? Did I miss a Rashi class? Because I tried to get... No, keep... no, no because there's no a book club tonight. Okay. So we push up to eight. In that case, I don't feel bad. Hi, Carmela. Hi, Rabbi. We need people to come in. Carmela. We'll begin. Hi, Nisim. Hi, Rabbi. How are you? Hi, Hashem. Hi, Ninet. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you both. Thank you. Mark, good to see you. Nice to see you too. You know, before the before the days of COVID, you could say uh, you would say good to see you in person, but now that means something else. <laughs> it's only been a year. It's only been a year. Don't worry. <laughs> Just hang in there. <laughs> Okay, I think we're going to begin. Second. Really? Lovely people. Oh, really? Hi, Daniel. Hi, Lisa. <clears throat> okay, so um, first of all, I strongly recommend that if anyone's got an Haggadah, I know it's still, uh, we're still not close enough to Pesach to pull out the Haggadot, but it's most likely worthwhile to actually pull out a Haggadah to try and kind of go through a little bit the simple understanding of the Haggadah. I'm going to go get the Haggadah. <clears throat> Okay, so we are going to discuss tonight something very important, a really vital aspect of Pesach. Um, this is a very new approach. I mean, the general underlying theme obviously is not new, but this is something new I, I learned this year. I heard this from Reuven Leuchter, uh, Rabbi in Israel. Um, I think it's a very unique approach, but I think it kind of brings out the underlying understanding of what Pesach is. So what I want to do a little bit is, first of all, just to talk about the background of the Haggadah. And really, what is what are we trying to do? So, as you may know, may not know, that the... Chag HaPesach, Chag HaPesach is one of the, or should I say, the most celebrated holiday in Jewish tradition, even more celebrated in Yom Kippur. Um, I think I saw somewhere that they estimate 90% of Israelis keep uh, a Passover Seder. Mm. So, you know, Pesach is really one of those really incredible experiences which is not just an incredible experience but clearly something has worked in terms of an educational experience whereby 4,000 almost 4,000 years later when we came out from Egypt mm. we're still what? celebrating and talking about the how the Geula how we came out from slavery to um to Herut, to freedom. So, so something somewhere along the line is going right. Okay, And the fact that so many people celebrate it and it's the most celebrated uh, Jewish holiday, um, there's something seemingly which is got to tick us. And the truth is, Chachamim tell us, our sages tell us that Pesach is actually the most central Chag to the Jewish people. So what I want to do a little bit today is try and kind of break that down 
um, a little bit with your help. So we're going to try and do a bit of a, um, a backward and forwards over here. Um, but just to give you just a bit of a, a little bit of a background, just want to speak about the chinuch element, the educational experience. There is two verses in the Torah that talks about the importance of education and giving over to the next generation, specifically the night of Petah. One is Vehigad Talavincha, the obligation of giving over to one's children. And the second one is Vehayakish Alcha Bincha Machar Lemor, Mazot, which we mentioned both in the Haggadah. The, both of them are questions which children ask the parents or that we are obligated to relate over to our children. That means when we talk about tradition, passing over, handing over the torch from one generation to the next generation, if you'd ask me out the whole year, what's the most important time of the year for passing over the torch? That will be the night of Pesach. And what we want to try and understand is why is it so important and why is it so central to us as Jews? And clearly, it actually worked because everyone's still keeping it. What's interesting to note um, for, the, for the educators amongst us, um, it's interesting to note that you have almost every element of uh, practical um, uh, teaching skills in the Pesach Seder. So you have kind of a audio-visual experience, an encounter which has an element of storytelling, it has questions and answers, it has, we use our senses, we, we do things to make children ask questions. These are incredible uh, ideas, you know, we just have to look to the Torah to, to show how to teach. And again, it works because Three and a half thousand years later, we're still doing it. So there is something called a mitzvah of, of the night of Pesach called Sipur Yitziat Mitzrayim. There's an obligation to retell the story of how we came out from Egypt back in the day till, till basically how we came out of Egypt, the whole story of the Exodus. What's interesting to note also is Rambam says, what happens if you don't have children? What happens if you're sitting alone at the Seder table? Guess what? Who would have ever believed people are sitting alone at the Seder table? Yes. I was actually reading a Haggadah from two years ago and someone wrote, um, could you imagine someone will be sitting alone at the Seder table? And just one year later, you know, we've been one year and people were sitting alone last year at the Seder table not necessarily by choice. So, you know, the Rambam says as follows, what happens if you are alone? Do you have to go ahead and say over the Haggadah in the same format that we have it? What's the sim simple format? Simple format is we ask Manishtana four questions and then we go through kind of a whole long winded, long -winded Magid to try and get to the answer. Bit of a complicated answer which we're trying to, to go through why it's why each part is connected. So anyway, any suggestions? Do you think a person should have the obligation to go ahead and speak out speak out the whole Sipuritsi at Mitraim if a person A has been to Hebrew school, at least, and B, he's never been, he's not talking to anyone. She's not talking to anyone. Anyone? And, and if yes, or if no, then why? And says yes. The question is why? Any suggestions? Is it because um, we, are, we say, The obligation is for us to see, um, to imagine 
ourselves as if we had exited Egypt. So that sort of um, obligation and commitment falls upon each and every individual. In addition to Vihigara Televincha, the mitzvah of telling the story to our children or the next generation. So I, I agree that there's an obligation of Sipuriti and Mitzrayim. The question was, do we need to have it in question answer format? Can I not just read now all the Midrashim about how we came out and all the different miracles, what, which God did for us and incredible how he took us out with an outstretched hand and so on and so forth. Why do I need, you know, Manishtana, Ari singing the song? I can't bother for songs now. You know what? I want to get a move on. I want to get to the crux of things. <laughs> What's so important about the question answer format that we have throughout? And it's like kind of such a central point, Manishtana. Make such a big deal out of it. And really, the whole Magid is really an answer to the, the question of the children. But as you've all guessed, Rambam, and this is brought down in Shulchan Aruch, says, the Lacha would be, if a person is alone at home, then a person should say it over to their spouse. If a person is at home alone, literally, then they should say it over to themselves. Some people like to talk about the children within us, you know, and, and all that, that sort of idea, which is a beautiful idea. But I want to kind of touch on a, a bit of a different experience. What we have on Lela Seder is really a story. story. And what often happens, unfortunately, this is uh, how things have evolved, but very often the kids come home from school and each kid's got to book this size of all the activities they've done in, in school. And each one's got another idea they want to say. And each part of the Haggadah, everyone wants to say another idea. And by the time you get, to, you know, an hour in and you haven't even got past Manishtana, you know, you want to kind of just run through the Haggadah, get to the matzah because everybody's hungry. And then we're kind of, by the time you've drunk two cups of wine, you're already starting to feel a little tipsy. And then, you know, that's you come around and they start, the kids start bargaining, half of them are crying because they're ready, ready to go to bed. And it's basically very quickly all over. So what tends to happen in general is the first part of the Haggadah is really kind of, you know, elaborated on quite in, from an extreme, uh, quite, quite extremely. And then later on, when we talk about the actual main parts of the Haggadah, which is the vital part of the Haggadah, we kind of miss the boat. And even if we do manage to go slowly, but what often happens in most uh, houses that we talk about different ideas and each one's got a different... Uh, sweet idea, which, you know, I think Haggadah is one of the most published books on an annual basis, uh, most published uh, book with co most commentaries, should I say. Um, that, you know, every year there's another, you know, 20 Haggadot on the market with, with different people's uh, explanations on how you connect everything. And every, all of them very beautiful. But there's so much to say and so little time. And we kind of get carried away with everything. So... I really want to focus very specifically on one point. And, and so here it goes, and then we're going to start to go through the story and try and understand it. Ramban says, Ahmadis, that Lel HaSeder, first of all, we have a concept called Seder night, right? It's called Lel HaSeder. What is a Seder? Seder is an order. Order, yeah. We have traditionally, we have Kadesh, Urchat, Karpas, Yachat. We have a specific order. There's something very strange about the order. Because before we start anything, the first thing you do is have Kiddush. And you wash your hands. So, so far, so good. Kadesh. Number two, you wash your hands, Urchat. What should happen next? Eat. <laughs> you should eat the meal. Yeah, eat. Hey, one second. Karpas. Karpas. <laughs> okay. All right. So you want to have a bit of a... Uh, vegetables or something to, to eat and a bit to open up your appetite, no problem. Okay, that was the way of the kings and the, the aristocrats. Okay, so we get to the matzah yachat. Okay, we're going to take the matzah, pull the matzah out. We break it. We take one piece, we gave it to and one put it in, and one we put back. Hey, what happened to the meal? Maggi, we pour the wine. Okay, the kids getting excited. No, we're going to have another cup of wine. All of a sudden, story. It's another two hours until we begin uh, even, even talking about drinking the wine and then eating matzah. I mean, what's going on over here? Yet there's an order, and we call the whole Seder night Lel HaSeder. 
So what is this order? And what is this in order? What's the point of this? Raman says something very powerful. I really think this is a, a fundamental. Nachmanadi says that what happens on Seder night is actually us relating over to our children to give over to the next generation, essentially, obviously, and to ourselves, a story, an experience. An experience of what? An experience of emuna, an experience of faith. In fact, we Sfaradim call it Chag HaEmunah. Call it, the, the Moroccans have a custom to have Mimuna, yeah. the end of Pesach, because we're going out of the Chag and we're taking with us this Emuna, which we've learned the whole of Pesach, this centralized theme of Pesach, we're going to go through and carry with us throughout the year. But the main part of our faith is what happens on Seder night? Because Seder night is the birth of Klal Yisrael. The birth of the Jewish people takes place on this night. And what we do is we go through the different steps. And the Gemara says we have to start from the very begin beginning stages. The question, the Gemara, what does the beginning stages start from? But either way, we start from the beginning and how we go through the whole system until we are finally brought out. So, the obligation of Sipuri Yitziat Mitzrayim, the obligation of the story, is an obligation to create and understand what that story is. And the second we lose that story, we've missed the boat. So what we have to do is, if we basically don't understand what we're saying during Magid, we packed it in. So let's try and go through slowly a little bit that we can do over the next uh, 30, 40 minutes um, to understand really the breakdown of Magid. Okay, so we've we had Karpas, Yachat, Magid, and we have the custom to Bibhilu, different uh, Bibhilu, Yatan, Mitraim, put the Kiara over the head again, just to encourage the children to ask questions. Going back to the point of how you actually want to tell a story in the most um, attractive way is when you get someone to ask a question, then you'll be able to bring an answer out. So we do all these strange things, which will kind of bring out questions. And before we start, we've kind of enticed the children to start asking. So the first thing we do before we get to Manishtana is we open up with a statement. Different uh, uh, ways of a uh, different Agadot. This is the bread of affliction. Interesting to note, the first part of Magid is written in, not in Hebrew, like the rest of the Haggadah, it's written in Aramaic. Why is that? So who, first of all, who wrote the Haggadah? Anyone know? Good question. Historically, where does it come from? Who made it? I heard it's Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu? <laughs> no? Hello? You heard it, eh? You heard it was Moshe. I heard it. Somebody mentioned that. Interesting to note, Leal. Interesting to note that you mentioned that. Moshe Rabbeinu is not mentioned once in the entire Haggadah. Yeah. Incredible. You would think the leader of Klal Yisrael takes us out of, of Egypt. And because of him, we kind of got the Torah and everything. And he's not mentioned once in the Haggadah. If God, if God is not, if God is not in the Megillah, what's the big deal that Moshe is not? If God is not in the Megillah, what's the big deal that Moshe is not in the Agadah? In the Agadah. Okay. Nice, nice. Answer. By the way, nice. uh, and furthermore, I would an answer, add that there's no uh, way nice that idea. one person wrote it. There's no way that one person wrote it. They could have ordered it, but they didn't write it. Okay, so the question is, first of all, where does it come from? At least, where's the earliest Haggadah? Where's the origin for the Agadah? Anyone? Yeah. So um, I think that maybe it's connected to some kind of a Sandrin or um, a group of rabbis that did it maybe after the second temple destruction, something that uh, filled the void of, uh, you know, the Jewish disaster and the exile. Right. I, so th I, th I think the antecedents were at the time of Sinai. 
I wasn't the there then. Not, not, the, not the form of it, but the antecedents to tell the story. Oh, okay. So very good. So first of all, who said Moshe? Yeah, I mean, it says in the Torah that that on that day, Pesach, we have an obligation to go and say over the story of Sipur Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So already the president to actually say some sort of giving over is already from the Torah. Mitzvah Doraita, in fact, there's a special Mitzvah Doraita, biblical obligation to go and say um, some form of the story of the Exodus on the night of Pesach. The exact precise format was um, later done at approximately the time of the, what Eyal said, in the time of Bai Cheni, the end of the, the second uh, temple period. Um, there's, a, there's a much discussion. It's not so clear exactly who wrote it. Um, could be the Anche Knesset Agdola, the members of the Great Assembly, who essentially also... Why, why they were uh, We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, um, there are some people, I think that it's the uh, Barbanel, the great Spanish uh, um, uh, treasurer of the king, who actually suggested it was actually Rebbe, Rebbe Hudanasi, the redactor of the Mishnah. There's much discussion, but in fact, the Gemara, the Talmud, actually talks about a machloket, an argument between Rav and Shmuel, exactly which part, about certain parts of the Haggadah. So, we see it's, it's, it's very early on, it's more than 2,000 years old. Um, we find the Rambam, Maimonides, 1,000 years ago, has got a certain version of the Haggadah, albeit a, a, an abridged version of the Haggadah, but he's got some sort of uh, Haggadah at the back of Bilchot Chametz Mata. And later on, what happened was the Haggadah kind of evolved and different parts of different Midrashim got added over the ages. Um, back to your question, um, Dan. So some say that Halach Ma'anya was actually added later on in Babylon. Ah. And the, the, the spoken language there was Arabic, was Aramaic, and therefore, like the language of the Gemara, the Talmud, and that was later on. This first part, according to some, was actually added much later. But either way, the introduction to the whole uh, kind of part of Magi, before we ask the questions, Halak Ma'anya. Hold up the, the matzah, the Iraqis have a custom to put the matzah on the back, the Moroccans have a custom to put the matzah over their heads, different customs. And they take the matzah, and they say, this is bread of affliction. The poor man's bread. This is the bread of affliction. Let's translate. The Akhlu Avatana Barad Mitzrayim, that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt, Whoever wants should come in and eat. Whoever's needy, come in and eat. Now the next year will be in the land of Israel. Now we are slaves, and the next year we will be free people. So, in before we begin Magid, there's quite a few things over here which are a little bit difficult to understand. So, first of all, if I ask you, what does matzah? actually resemble? Does matzah resemble freedom? Or does matzah resemble bread of affliction? Anyone? Well, for me, it's a bread of affliction. That was the poor man's bread as we were slaves. That's what we had. And it, it's more for remembrance when we have the Seder to remember that as we go through the story. Okay, so if I ask you, is matzah a symbol of Cherut of freedom, or is matzah a symbol of uh, avdut, slavery? You're telling survival. me survival. We just said it. Survival. Yeah, I'm gonna take the other point of view too. Um, we are free to be able to celebrate our Jewish customs in this society, and that's not true for Jews throughout much of history. So, in a certain way, it's both. I mean, I think you could argue well for both, but I think we probably need both in there in order to create that dynamic uh, so that we can have these kinds of discussions and arguments. <laughs> so Ron's saying something very beautiful. But I use that in our Seder, I use that because before the meal, as you say, to get prepared, 
we have to remember the reason that we're able to enjoy the festival, the feast in front of us is because we remember where we were before and what happened allowed us then to get to the point to be able to reach that point where we can actually you know, enjoy the feast that we've got. So the, it's the whole concept of, for me anyways, and that's what I've been using my family, is right. to remember that this is our bread of affliction. Not, we're not celebrating that we can eat the matzah. It's to remember what our forefathers had to go through and our families had to go through to get to the point where we are. Okay, I'll get back to you on that one, Dan, one second. Um, Eyal and Shlomo. Yeah, I want just to... Oh, sorry, Dan. No, no, done. Yeah. Oh, me, who's talking? You. Oh, so I just want to mention another thing about the matzah, uh, which is uh, became a, a very, um, very major focus of the Christian church in the Middle Ages uh, with the blood labels. You know, where uh, Jews were accused of uh, uh, kidnapping young children, boys, <clears throat> taking the blood and making matzah for Pesach. And this story was very common, very popular, and many Jews were killed for because of that. So the matzah is actually quite a, a major, you know, issue. This kind of a strange, you know. Yeah, very interesting. <clears throat> it's a very interesting point that why specifically the matzah was used as a, you know, a blood libel um, until about 100 years ago, right? The last blood libel. In Still uh, quite popular some, in some places. <clears throat> right. Um, Shlomo? Just wanted to say, it's, it's a bread of transition. Bread of transition. Can you explain? You're asking if it's uh, bread of freedom or, or bread of uh, flavor, uh, um, slavery. And Ron said it's both, and I say it's neither. It's in transition. <laughs> okay, but, but I want you to elaborate. We just said now, halach ma'anya, this is the poor man's because, because this is what you had to do on the rush, like Sam said, survival. You're going from position A to position B, and you got to do something in between, and this is what you eat in between. You have to it's stay like, alive. It's like, like you have to you're stay going, alive. You're taking cans of uh, beans to camping. So you can, like Sam said, you stay alive. It's not what you eat every day. It's not what you eat when you're free. It's not what you eat when you are a slave. You eat because you have to. It's basic level. It's the very basic. It's the lowest. It's to stay in this world. So uh, the whole mission is along with it, but it's later. First, we have to stay alive. So I, I, I like, I think, you know, I think I like everything, whatever you're saying. I like I the way that the transition love. Sorry. It's a transition between being thin to being fat after the <laughs> after <laughs> Okay. Um, the the question is, if you look very at the almost the end of Magid, we say there are three things that a person has to eat. A person has to say. Rabban Gamliel Hayaomer. Kol mishlo amashlo shat varim elu the Pesach lo yatzei dechvato. Anybody who didn't say. These three things, lo yatsai dechavato. Ve'elohen, Pesach, Matzah, Umaror. The person wants to know, what is the minimum amount of the Haggadah a person has to have? A woman had a baby. She's in the hospital. She wants to eat Matzah. She wants to know how much of the Haggadah I have to, have, have to say. I have to read the whole Haggadah? You've got to be kidding me. Kol shelo amash bashat varim elu Pesach, lo yatsai dechavato. Say three parts. Pesach, Matzah, Umaror. You have to understand them. And then the Baal Haggadah, the author of the Haggadah, um, or first, should I say, uh, elaborate. Pesach, because when we came out to the, it was the Quran Pesach, because, because um, God uh, jumped over the, over the houses, Passover. Maror, we know why we have Maror, because it reminds us the better herbs, it reminds us about how the, the Egyptians kind of enslaved us and embittered our lives. And then we say, Matzah zu shanu achlim al shumma. This Matzah, we point to the Matzah, we lift up the Matzah, it's custom. Why do we have it? And I'll read you what the, 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 the Haggadah says. It doesn't say to remind us of when we, we were in Egypt and we were so enslaved and we were so bitter. Because our bread did not have opportunity to rise. Why? Because we were running out. And the Pasuk, which they quote, uh, God uh, took us out of Egypt. 
and we had to, uh, we didn't have time for the, for the bread to rise. And so we have matzah. So if you want to know which part of the exodus does the matzah symbolize, is it the beginning part where we're, you know, crushed and it's like the maror and we're, we're kind of in there with the charoset and the cement and all the slavery? Or is it the end part where we're getting out of Egypt, where Paro is coming and said, get out of here, I'm done with you. And the, the Jewish people are going out with Birchush Gadol, with so much richness, so much wealth, and they're finally free. And they just didn't have time because they're being kicked out of Egypt, like kind of get out of your prison. So there seems to be a bit of a paradox over here between the beginning of the Haggadah and the end of, Haggadah, of the Haggadah. Is Halach Ma'anya, this Matzah, is the bread of affliction? And this is what the Matzah symbolizes. Or is the Matzah, like we say at the end of Magid, this Matzah actually reminds us of freedom. So Ron touched upon this. And I like this idea of that transition, all, this, all the ideas that were said. Um, it's survival. It's Pesach in general is really about understanding the paradoxes. Pesach, Matzah actually does kind of give us both of these aspects, these elements. And we have to try and figure out how we deal with that sort of situation. And really, as we go into Manishtana, there are four questions. And the question is all about this. This is strange. What's going on over here? But I think what the underlying principle is so, is so important over here. It is emuna. It's not a philosophical idea. What does that mean? When we invite people in, we invite people through the door on Pesach. Now, the normal time to invite is not once you start the meal. We say, this is the bread of affliction. Everybody wants to come in. All the hungry, all the needy should come through the door. Now you're inviting? It's just the wrong time. It's misplaced. What, what is this part of the Haggadah? This is kind of the introduction. That's so vital over here. And I think the emphasis over here is, is on the kol. Kol dichvim. Can you imagine a person? When we invite guests, people usually tend to invite their own social circle. People who are related to them, to them people who are kind of within their level of uh, thinking, people who are, um, you know, certain social status, all that sort of stuff. But what's happening over here is saying, Kol we are establishing a story over here. What is the story? The story is the emuna that we have, the Hakadosh Baruch Hu, we're bringing God into our lives. We're inviting God in. This is when we talk about the birth of the Jewish people, the birth of the Jewish nation. This is where it starts. Kol everyone is invited. What does that mean? We're not just inviting the great Jewish intellectuals. And there's many. We're not inviting all the great Jewish philanthropists. And there's many. We're not inviting people who are on the same social standard as us. We're inviting kol dichvin yete ve'echol. Kol ditzrich yete ve'echol. Why do we invite everybody? Because tonight is the night where we talk about our essence. Our essence is that we were once in Egypt and we were a nation. And that's where it all began. And when we were at the very bottom of the ladder, Elosh Baruch Hu came and took us out. And the fundamental of Emunah, the fundamental of faith, begins on Lela Seder. And we create a story. And that story is an experience. And everything has to kind of link into that story. But that story is real emuna. Real emuna, real faith, is not based on questions of philosophy. You don't become a ma'amin. It doesn't strengthen your faith when you ask all sorts of philosophical questions about, you know, background and does God feel like this and does this, all that sort of stuff can ask it no problem, but not on the night of Pesach. Or I should say, the focus is not on that. Why is that? 
Because the night of Pesach, we're trying to bring out this fundamental, this experience. We went through an experience, and as Ellen mentioned before, that we have to go through the story of Egypt. Every person has to look through this story and imagine themselves going through Egypt and coming out. Why is that? Because emunah really is reality. There's a certain reality. It's not philosophy. There's a certain reality in this world, which we live with. That reality is not necessarily what you see. Because emunah tells us that, one second, there's a paradox going on over here. There's a matzah. Matzah symbolizes, on one hand, bread of affliction. On the other hand, it symbolizes freedom. How do the two get together? How do we, when we have struggles in life and we have issues to try and understand what's going on in this world, that is emunah. That's when emunah comes into play. And we say, there must be something else going on over here. There must be a different approach about what's going on over here. There must be a different angle. What I'm seeing is not really the reality. That's emuna. And we consistently start asking questions. And we ask, and we ask, and we try and understand the paradoxes. And that's the whole manishtana. And we go through the whole Haggadah like that. And it's all for one thing, to bring out this vital aspect of emuna. That emuna is HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the world. HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to the nation, kind of, we let him in. We invited HaKadosh Baruch Hu in. And that's when he took us out of Egypt. We have to be opened up to a much deeper level. It means when you don't have questions, you don't get to the next level. When you just understand something, somebody tells you something, an idea, very nice. You don't grow from that. Growth is when you have a question. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a contradiction over here. I don't understand. Daddy, mommy, explain to me. I've got a situation in life where good things are happening to bad people, bad things are happening to good people. It's, the reality doesn't make sense. That's when we put on our emunah glasses and we say, one second, let's dig a little deeper. Let's make seder. Let's make a seder night. Let's make order over here. This is not how it should be. So how could it be? Ah, there's something deeper. And that's our job on Seder night. And when we are able to give over that level of emunah to the next generation, then they can live through that. And then pass it on to the next generation. So let's just go through the, the Haggadah one by one. Kind of with this, again, this is just one approach. I think it's a very uh, important fundamental to our, our daily lives. So, we ask four questions. First question is, why do we dip twice? You're dipping bitter herbs in charoset. Charoset is to remind you of the cement. Bitter herbs to remind you of the bitterness. Paradox. You're eating carapas. Why do you eat carapas? Anyone? Ramana? The spring, you know? No. Why do we have carapas? Why do we have these, this appetizer? What does carapas they eat? Sorry? What is Carabas? They read. Carpas. Carpas. Ah, Carpas. The connection with Hashem. That what? Yeah. We have Kadesh Urchat Carpas. Why do we have? The Gemara says because in the olden days, the aristocrats used to have this appetizer at the beginning of the meal. But the next part of the Haggadah is Halach Ma'anya where we talk about how we celebrate the affliction of the Jewish people, or celebrate or commemorate, we say. So again, the children are asking, you're having one side, you're having karpas, but later on in the evening, you're having 
Maror. Maror is a bit of hope. So one second. Are we celebrating tonight how we're free people? Or are we celebrating tonight how we're, how we're slaves? Yeah. What are we focusing on? The children don't understand what's going on. No, but uh, the rabbi, you, you just said basically that the Agadah is about contradictions uh, that work together. We, we celebrate them both, you know? Oh, but, but this, is, this is the question the children are asking. And we're trying to figure out, the children are just seeing straightforward contradictions. The theme of the night is contradictions, right? We're, we're leaning, but we're, we're dipping in maror. We're, we're eating uh, appetizers, but we're eating matzah, which is bread of affliction. Um, these are the four questions of, of Manishtana, which the kids are trying to understand. So what we really do is, is we kind of give a short answer just to kind of get the kids uh, a simple understanding. And then we go and elaborate. And the short answer is as follows. Avadim hayinu lefparo b'mitzrayim. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now I'm going to read this out to you because I want to, you, I want to understand this. Vayotzienu Adonai lehenu misham. And God took us out of Egypt. B'yad chazakah was running to Yah with a strong hand, an outstretched hand. And this is now, now here's a, a, a funny thing we say. And if God would have not taken us out of Egypt, Adain, still, Anachnu, we, Ubanenu, Nebanenu, our children, our grandchildren, Meshubadim, Hayinu, Leparov, Mitzrayim. We would all still be um, captive to Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, I want to ask you is that a fair statement? The last time I checked, there was a United Nations, which was established for exactly for this reason. If we poor persecuted Jews, we're going to be stuck in Egypt until today. United Nations will come and say, guys, establish the land of Israel. Do you mean, first of all, question number one. We're trying to answer four questions. I don't see any answer to the question. Question number two is, what's the second statement? And you should just know if God wouldn't have took us out, then, oh, we would still, we would still be there in Egypt, stuck there. I don't think it's true. Can anyone enlighten me? Any suggestions? This is, we haven't even started Magid yet. This is literally the beginning. Well, I, I prefer to go back a few hundred years with Abraham being told by Hashem that the people will be enslaved for whether it's 210 or 430 years. You're jumping, you're giving, you're giving historical perspective. It's, it's great. We're yes. going to get there later on. But we, we just started the Haggadah. And so the question, but the question is, what did we do to deserve to be enslaved for 200 whatever years before Hashem decides that, oh, he remembered us and he's going to release, you know, uh, uh, free us? I mean, what is the, to me, that's a question that comes up to, in our state at all times. And I don't have a, a, a real answer as to why that occurred that way. That's a very good question. And it's interesting, it's not one of the questions of the Haggadah, right? I know. The questions that children ask. We can ask it later on, and it always comes up every year in every house. You're 100% right. And it's a vital question, but if we focus on the Manishtana, which is the central theme of what we're trying to answer through Magid, we're trying to answer it in a simple, simplistic way. We make a statement, one statement which seemingly doesn't really answer any of the questions. And the second statement which we say is, is doesn't even seem true. Anyone? Back on Car the Karpas, um, just to go back for, to there, um, I think that Rashi says something about it representing Joseph's coat of many colors, because in, in um, Miglat Esther, it mentions Karpas meaning wool or something. So that's how we got stuck in Egypt in the first place, was because uh, Jacob favored, uh, fav favored his son. And, uh, and in a certain sense, it's uh, a reminder of the fact of how we made the journey there 
and then fitting with on top of that, the moror says, and this is how it was for you eventually when you were there. And then, of course, after that, we then move more into freedom from there. Uh, the other answer is, I think it's a token acknowledgement to vegetarians. <laughs> Later on, there's... Right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Ron, what you're saying is 100% true. And um, I don't think it's Rashi. I can't remember who does say, who says it, but they, they do, do quote it. Um, Except the um, vegetarian part. <laughs> Um, I've got a, I've got one more question before before we try and attempt to uh, answer it or suggest an answer. The there's another question. We say the ilu lo hotziah kadosh baruch hu et haotzen mitzrayim, and if God wouldn't have taken us out, then we'd still be there. Can I translate that in simple English? If history wouldn't be history then everything would be different. <laughs> what a statement. If my father and mother wouldn't have got married, I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> if Napoleon didn't want to conquer Russia, then the whole world... Well, what's that got to do with anything? That is what history looks like. We would still be there. It would still, history would be look completely different. There's, there seems to be no relevance to the question. Anyone? Guys, come on. This is, this is, the Baba, what's the question again? Well, <laughs> obviously, if we, if history is history, there's nothing to discuss. Well, Rabbi, you happened, so, no, I'm sorry, and, Rabbi, no. you're simplifying it. I, I, because I'm you're saying, what it says. no, you're simplifying well, history, it. History, that, 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 that's not what the Pasuk is saying. The Pasuk is not saying this is history and that's it. The Pasuk is saying, if we will not be taken out by God from Egypt, we will still be slaves till right now, which is part of telling the story as if you were there. Because can you imagine? We'll be sitting here, but we will not be free. We'll be slaves. That's a big statement. That's a big opening statement. It's not. A, it's not a rhetorical statement. It is this statement. If, if that will not happen, you guys sitting here tonight, you will still be slaves, and then you can try to. Then you can experience the evening. So, so I'm going to ask you back the second question. Then, is that true? I don't think it's true. I think the UN would have come and saved us. You don't know that. Yeah, yeah but he says that. He says he thinks it's right. World yeah. history has shown such. You're right. I don't know, but you know, it, it's a bit of a broad statement to say, kind of thing. It's it's it doesn't seem relevant. At, definitely not at this section. Put it that way. I don't think it's true. Okay, so but isn't that part of building the emu now that we're talking about here, and the fact that. Oh, for that's sure. how it, it establishes us as a people to have that faith and say, uh, if that didn't happen, you know, then we wouldn't be a nation. And that's uh, the whole point is having the faith that made us a nation to be able to come out. For sure, that's the answer. But we're trying to understand what's the connection. So, so the simple, the, the understanding is like this, or one of the understandings. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. Here's the emphasis. Who took us out? Our God. Yeah. Our God. Our association to God happened in the birth of the Jewish people in Mitzrayim. Our God, this is our Emunah, our faith is that our God took us out of Egypt when we were struggling. And the ilu lo tzi akadosh baruch hu da uten mitzrayim adai anachu banev bnei bnei mushubadim ayin leparav mitzrayim. And if not, then here's the catch: the world was created for the Jewish people. What does that mean? What to bring 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu into this world, the purpose of the world was to bring God into the world. Who are the ambassadors of that, that bring God into the world? The Jewish people. Where did it start? In Mitzrayim. That means, essentially, if there's no God in the world, or godliness in the world, then Mitzrayim and Paro were still back there. Because this, the world history does not continue. World history evolved. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in Darwinism. World history evolved because there is godliness in this world. As ambassadors of that, we, the Jewish people, brought that godliness out into the world. Hence the concept of light upon the nations. The concept of Lela Seder is to bring out this emuna, to bring out this faith, to understand that it's fundamental to us and it's an experience which we have to, each and every single one of us, relive. And it's not just back in the day, but today, that we have an obligation to relive that experience. Because emunah is not just like, you know, fancy business which we try to cover up. There's realities in the world, there's a life which we have to live, and there's things which we don't understand. And when we put on those glasses, we understand there's something much deeper. And every year when we go and try and get into that story, and yes, when you tell over a story, every time you tell over a story, you tell it in a different way. Because you're reliving that experience in a different form, from a different angle. And it's got to be relevant to you today. So you put on those clothes and you say, now I'm looking through the lens of this challenge, of today's challenges, of Pesach in COVID. And I'm saying, how could it be? That is what Emunah is. That is what the Sipuriti al Mitraim is. And we have to hang on to the story throughout. And the next part is, if we are all chachamim, wise people, kulan nevonim, people deep thinkers, kulan yodim ta Torah, people who understand the Torah, mitzvah aleinu l'saper b'tiyat mitzrayim. It's a mitzvah to say over the story of Egypt, of the Exodus. And whoever does it so much, uh, plentiful, is is even better. What does that mean? We're fully developed. What happens? We're intellectuals, we're philosophers. We've got it all right. We've got to understand. We understand everything. We're the wisest of men. We still have an obligation. Why? Because you're telling over a story which is becoming the experience of your spiritual identity. Where it all began and where it continues today. Because if we wouldn't, we would still be there. We'll still be back in Egypt because Hashem's godliness has to be brought out into this world. And how do we do that? By having this emunah. By understanding, appreciating there's something beneath the layers. Peel off the layers of the onion. Understand there's something much deeper. There's room for growth. There's room for understanding that what we see on a simplistic level and you see paradoxes, you see contradictions, that is not the reality. The reality is God. The reality is godliness. The reality is emunah. And if we experience that story and continue, it makes no difference how wise we are. We've got all the answers. It's not a philosophical discussion, a brain teaser. This is our essence. Rabbi, uh, would you say that Migrat Esther uh, has the same uh, purpose? Megillat Esther has a different channel. It, it channels, a, a, it's got a different job. Tiyad Mitraim, Sipuri Tiyad Mitraim is specifically one night where we educate ourselves, the next generation, and we pass on over the torch. We understand that there's a very new reality which we have to reckon with. We don't understand things. So let's try and understand what's, what's a little bit deep. Let's go to the next step. To understand where we come from, what's the point of where we came from, and even the the the, the lowest level, Rosh Baruch who came into us in the, into our lives in the, 
in the lowest state until he brought us out to, to, to Matan Torah. But Gilat Esther is like a completely different uh, uh, idea, which is, it, I, it's, it's related to the concept of Emunah, that everything is behind the scenes. We spoke about it a few weeks ago, the concept of um, behind the scenes, HaKadosh Baruch who still runs things behind the scenes, even in Babel, even in Babylon, in, in, in exile, that was a, there was, there was certain, you know, Hashem was pulling the strings from behind the, the, the puppet show. And even after Mashiach comes, no more Haggadah. Right, right. No more Purim. Right, so that, that's a different idea. But let's, let's go on one more bit because we only got four minutes. These five rabbis sitting in Bnei Brak. Great story. Guys, just hang in there. We're going to say a story now. And they're saying a beautiful story the whole night. Until the students came out to them. Guys, you forgot your watches. It's time for Shachrit. You were talking the whole night. Yalla, no start saying Kriyat Shema. What on earth? Where does this come in? Oh, just because we just said that, you know, there's a mitzvah, because it's such a nice mitzvah to say over the, the uh, to, to, to speak a lot about, yeah, about uh, the story of Egypt. That's why uh, these rabbis, oh, I'm just going to give you a proof, just in case you don't believe me, that there was a bunch of rabbis and they were singing B'nai Brak until they, slid, they said it all night. Is, is that what we're talking about here? And the answer is the same thing. These are the greatest rabbis of the generation. Shayumu Subim Bunebra. Five biggest rabbis in it. Rabbi Kiva. Kiva, Moshe Rabbeinu said, when God says you give the Torah through Moshe Rabbeinu, the Gemara says, Moshe Rabbeinu said, he looked through the later generation, he said he saw Rabbi Kiva. He said you should do it through him. This is Rabbi Kiva. This is Rabbi Lezer Bishwa, his rabbis. Rabbi Lezer Nazaria. Greatest of people. And Rabbi Tarifon. And the city of Bnei Brak. They're speaking out in Siyad Mitzrayim. The greatest intellectuals. Kola Torah Kula. The entire Torah is mapped out in front of them. But they're sitting the whole night. It's night. They're sitting through this alternative reality. They're living in another world. They're getting carried away in this darkness. They're getting carried away in a world which they thought was reality. But reality doesn't fit. So they're plugging away at Emunah, at how in the world of darkness, through the whole night, through challenges, where is God? Where was God in the Holocaust? They're plunging away the whole night until the students come the next morning, say, Rabbi come back to this world and connect the two. Come back and say, the Emunah which you've gone and appreciated that through the night, through the dark challenges and times, we're going to bring to today's day and age. We're going to kind of enlighten ourselves to appreciate this experience that we're now reliving. And it goes on and on. Like Sam said, not only now, but also the future. Reblazim and Azaria, Hareani Keben Shibim Shanam, like 70 years old. And also it seems to be completely random, this, this, uh, text in the Haggadah. Story of Lezman Azaria. He's, yeah, and, and Ron hid for the Kabbalists. Lezman Azaria was 18 years old when he became chief rabbi. Whole story there in the Gemara and Brachot. Um, the Kabbalists say that he was a Gilgul of Shmuel. Shmuel Hanavi. Shmuel Hanavi died when he was 52. Hare ani keben shivim shana. 52 plus 18. You got it. 70 years old. I'm like 70 years old. Because he was a Gilgul of Shmuel. But what's that going to do with anything? Same idea. Kol yamechayecha hayamin, kol yamechayecha ha'alelot, yamechayecha ha'olam hazeh, kol yamechayecha ha'alelot, yamechayecha ha'alelot, Regardless of, of the, if you go through the, the, the whole idea, the point is that this concept of Muna has to carry us through from Tiyad Mitzrayim until Yimot HaMashiach. That is the fundamental that we have all through this story which we have to deliver. And when we deliver that story properly to the next generation, that's how it goes over from one generation to the next. And that is really the, 
underlying principle. And then you got the, he says the Torah, and then you got Hasinai, and then through the lens of the Torah, you can understand the Emunah, but that's really the breakdown. So you can follow through the Haggadah with that. But the ultimate idea is the experience of understanding what Emunah is, what Emunah does to us in today's day and age, and to see that reality that there's layers and you develop it and there's something deeper. And a person appreciates that. A person become a much stronger person and use that going forward. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Rabbi Dayenu. <laughs> Can you remind us about next week? Next week, there's a special class um, with the Bet Din, with Rabbi Rosenblatt, Rabbi Fagelstock, and myself. The three giants. Moderated by Ellen, the one and only. Bezran Hashem, there'll be a very uh, three different dimensions. Um, there'll be a historical perspective. There'll be some unique um, customs, Sephardic, Ashkenazic, and, and Hasidic. And there'll also be a, a spiritual understanding, a social understanding, and a Kabbalistic understanding of what it means to be free. So that will be next Tuesday night at 8 to 9 p.m. Rabbi, thank you. thank you. It was an exceptional class. It was. It was. We all agree. Way to go. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. So when next week, the class the, about freedom, is there a charge? No, no. It's free too. Ron, for special for you only. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.